Hi everyone, I'm Josh with Josh Wright Piano TV and today I wanted to share three tips for mental health as a musician. These are very important concepts to keep your mind clear and these are things that I think about all the time and I tried to compile a list of three things, three of the most important things that I found helpful in my own journey even as of late. Um, the first thing is to know your limits so that you can continue to share great music with people and continue to be useful to people as a musician. Uh, a recent example from the Summer Olympics, um, Simone Biles made all the headlines by uh, stepping down when she was uh, experiencing something she calls the twisties, which is where she becomes disoriented in the air. So for her own <laughs> mental health and her own physical safety, she stepped down. Caused a lot of controversy. I'm not really sure why. Um, she was taking care of herself and uh, went on to cheer on her team. I mean, I had great admiration for what she did. Um, I want to look at that from a musician's perspective of the tasks that you do, not allowing those tasks to burn you out. So if there's a particular piece that's causing you absolute turmoil, it might be healthy to step away from it or practice it less. Um, sometimes when I have particular technical difficulties with something, I'll put it in a little box. I'll say, I get to practice on that for five or 10 minutes a day, and that's it. And that really helps my mental health to not be plaguing myself, uh, stretching myself beyond the limits. Sometimes it's a time thing. Uh, sometimes you're practicing so many hours that you become discouraged and you don't really know your limit until it's been crossed. Uh, another thing is all the tasks that you do as a musician. You don't just practice every day. So for instance, my life consists of practicing a lot. Um, I try to learn a new program every year. Uh, so that takes a lot of effort and work. I know there's people who are doing a lot more than one program a year, but that's what works for me. Um, I do a lot of private teaching, and then I run three online courses. So I run this YouTube channel. Uh, I consider that kind of like an online course, so Josh Wright Piano TV. If you're not already subscribed, uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing and liking this video, it helps to spread the word about this channel. Um, just helps to get this information out, which is my goal. I uh, would really appreciate that. Uh, my two other courses, Pro Practice and the VIP Masterclass series, um, also keep me really busy. So one strategy that I've used is batching activities. Um, so I'm not saying I do all my practicing I, on one day. I try to do practicing every single day because it's actually quite meditative and enjoyable for me. Um, but something that I have done with my online videos uh, for this channel and for my courses is I'll batch them together. So I might record this video tonight and then a few of the VIP Masterclass series videos and then um, it's getting pretty late so I might record a pro practice tutorial tomorrow or this weekend or something. But I like to do those in batches rather than, okay, I'm going to record one video every day. I'm doing four or five videos a week usually. And so it gets to be very draining if I every single day I've got to get dressed up in a suit. I've got to set up all my cameras and lights and, and um, everything else. And they're all pretty set up, but even just like those 10 or 15 minutes to get set up, ready every single day to record, that can be draining. So doing it all in one batch has really helped me. And then having a constant with my practicing every day. However, you can also batch things in your practicing. So you don't have to practice every single repertoire piece every day or every technical exercise that you have to do. You can use those as warm ups if they help you. But you can batch things in your practicing. So a lot of times I'll, I'll work on one piece a day, um, but I'll go really deep and get a lot done with that and then let that marinate for a few days. So knowing your limits uh, with time also can be very helpful for your mental clarity and your overall mental health to not get overburdened. There's a lot of days that I don't really feel like teaching. Um, or I don't really feel like recording, but I have a ton of energy to do the other activities. Uh, so knowing yourself and knowing how you function, I know a lot of teachers like to put all their students on one or two days, and then they have the rest of the week, like I would have the rest of the week to record videos and practice. Or maybe you like a little bit every day. Knowing yourself, knowing your own limits is very important for your mental health. Uh, that leads me into my second point. Uh, stop uh, having bullying um, influence your life. Sometimes it's unavoidable, um, but wherever you can avoid it, avoid bullying. So something, if you're posting a lot of YouTube videos like I am, 
you may have to step away from the comments section. Uh, I know I did many years ago. I'll usually read uh, the first you know few hours worth of comments on my videos because um, those are usually the most loyal subscribers to your channel anyway. Uh, I'll occasionally read a comment if someone references it in an email that they send me, but I have enough stuff to do that I can't be reading all my comments across my channel uh, at this point. But I had to step away from it, not only because it was t so time consuming, but also you, you tend to remember all the negative comments a lot more than you do the positive. For the most part, all the comments are positive, but there's a lot of people who've expressed hateful uh, remarks. There's been unsolicited unsolicited advice, teacher saying, I noticed you doing this, I can fix that for you, um, which I didn't really appreciate. And, uh, you know, students will even sometimes say that, you know, like they were saying that in the comments, like, my teacher said this, or I fixed this with this simple little idea. Um, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't spread good advice, but the way people present it can sometimes be hurtful or negative. So I had to step away from those comments. Also, uh, a more insidious uh, or, or so sorry let me finish like external bullying so if you have a music group that you perform for that's making you I know a lot of people are in like little music clubs and I have a student in one she loves it um, but some people that I've taught in the past have said you know I consistently perform for this group of people and they always have negative things to say and it dragged them down so much so I was like you just need to get rid of that find somebody else to play for someone I know there's going to be someone who appreciates your music um, or perhaps it's a teacher relationship. So um, maybe you need to find a new teacher if your teacher is constantly putting you down, making you feel terrible about yourself. There are enough good teachers out there that you don't need to stick with someone who makes you feel bad about yourself. You need to cut out the negative influences in your life because music's hard enough um, to not always have a negative influence. Now, that's not to say that your teacher needs to sugarcoat everything. I, re I like the blunt advice from my teachers. It's very helpful. But uh, they do it in a very loving way. They're not, you know, putting, and especially when teachers start to put you down as a person, uh, none of my three teachers um, uh, ever did that. So I've always really appreciated all of their advice over the years. Um, Susan Dwellmeyer, uh, Sergey Babayan, and Log Logan Skelton. Um, the more insidious type of bullying that I want you to avoid is uh, internal bullying. So I recently... Uh, actually, I finished all the tutorials for them as well. Finished uh, learning and memorizing and performing for the first time the Lisp Paganini Etudes. That was a pretty big undertaking. But guess what I was worried about during those Lisp Paganini Etudes? Not, I mean, there was places that I would, you know, occasionally, you know, work on. But I was thinking more about this program that I had last year and how my B major scale at the end of this Chopin felt. <laughs> And if you watch my performance, it went fine. But I was like, oh, it feels a little bit tight in one of these things. And I actually ended up meeting with uh, my teacher, Logan Skelton. Um, and he's like, oh, I know what you're doing. And he's like, here's how to fix it. And it helped tremendously. Um, so big thanks to Logan Skelton. But it was so silly. There was enough to work on in those Paganini etudes. And a B major scale was constantly plaguing me. And all my students, I've told them this. And so they're probably laughing if they're watching this. But um, it was interesting. I'd have success with something really difficult in the Paganini Etudes. Like I'd discover a new fingering. So like this one, for instance. I never really loved the clarity I got. I could do it after a couple tries, but then... Oh my gosh, if I just changed that fingering, it'd be this huge success. And then I'd be like, oh, I did something good. <laughs> And then I'd go into that and it's just like, why are you doing this to yourself? It's so silly. It's a negative pattern. Um, sometimes our minds uh, are our greatest tools, but they're also our greatest enemy. So um, my wife said something. She's like, you know, you've been given a great gift for this very analytical, almost OCD mind. Helps you figure things out. But you weren't given that mind. You were given that mind to create great music and great art, not to create internal chaos. And I loved that. I thought that was extremely profound. She's very wise. I'm still trying to get her to do a pro practice tutorial on this channel. Hopefully she hears this and she'll do it. <laughs> but uh, it's, isn't that so interesting? That I, there's a few things in the Paganini Etudes that bothered me that I was always a little nervous for. But the thing that plagued me during that whole process was an unrelated piece that I wasn't playing anymore. And I would just bully myself. Um, 
with that. And, you know, anytime I do something good, it was like that was always in the background playing on repeat. I did that for a long time with double thirds trills. Um, my hand just does not like double thirds trills in that fingering. I've said that a million times on this channel. My hand does not like opus 10 number two. Um, my hand likes rock three. My hand likes these Paganini etudes for the most part. My hand likes a lot of really difficult repertoire. So who cares? I was talking to a really, really um, well-known pianist. I'm not going to say his name just out of respect, but he said, um, I, I asked him, I was, it was when I was on my little double thirds kick, um, which was many years worth of kick. Um, <laughs> and I said, how did you get those this fast? And he's like, I can't really remember He's like, I just practice them a lot. He's like, but you know, it's interesting. Maybe you don't need to play that piece, Josh. And I was like, he's like, I've struggled my whole life with trills in my right hand. I was like, trills in your right hand? Like, that's so easy for me, you know? And I, was, I didn't say that to him. Um, but I was just thinking, oh my gosh, here's this world famous pianist. And, he's, and he fixed it. But he was saying, you know, that always was hard. And it got me thinking, um, Wow, like we all struggle with different things. And that's something I'm trying to do on this channel. I'm trying to diffuse this stupid myth that the very best of the best pianists, and I'm, I don't consider myself one of the best of the best pianists, but I know a lot of them personally, and they're my good friends, that they don't struggle with anything. A lot of my friends have, have shared things that they've struggled with that are, you know, incredible pianists. My teachers have uh, told me things they've struggled with. And sometimes those things are things that I don't struggle with at all. And other times there are things that people can do just like the wind, like Opus 10 number two. You can find 12-year-olds that can play it way faster than the majority of pianists. But we never hear about the things people struggle with because for some reason, the majority of this classical music world likes to keep things a secret. Um, they don't like to share information freely. They're very prideful and egotistical. Um, and they're scared to expose weakness. They're scared to expose a hand injury if they have a hand injury. It's, it's a very, um, I don't know where that necessarily comes from, um, but I think it's getting better. Um, but my teachers never exemplified any of those qualities. They were open. They shared so much with me. They were guiding lights in my life. So uh, making sure <laughs> that you realize other people struggle with things that you might find easy and vice versa. So if there's a particular thing that you struggle with, you know, put it in that little box. Like I said, you can work on five, 10 minutes a day, but don't sit and drill it endlessly because a lot of times I've actually made things worse by drilling it too much. Sometimes it's just a little bit of practice and then my hand loosens and then it works. But if I just sit and badger myself with that, like that stupid scale, I actually, I never thought of that scale as hard until I got it all the way up to tempo and then I started overthinking it and like my other scales didn't bug me. But for some reason, that little scale, because I drilled it so many times, started to give me problems. And then I started to question, how do I move on this? How? And it was a, a negative thought cycle that caused a lot of um, turmoil. My last point, I know I'm talking a lot, but I, I hope kind of talking through these things helps you um, if you're struggling with any of these things. Um, find a new pathway for the hand. So just like that fingering that I talked about in that Paganini etude. I've seen uh, a little piece that I'm, you know, dusting some cobwebs off. I uh, haven't really worked on it yet much. Uh, the Mozart F major. I played this a lot when I was a teenager in early 20s in competitions, and I played it in quite a few concerts. But the third movement, for instance, I was teaching it to a student, and she held her hand quite tight. And she could get through it, but I said, you know, if you think of kind of these circular motions, maybe move in a little bit for those black keys, kind of feel. Practice it plenty slowly. Make sure you have connection to the keys. And that helped tremendously, finding a new pathway. I'm talking about technique right now, but you can find a new pathway with any mental process uh, that might be plaguing you. So maybe it's, like I said earlier, finding a new teacher. Um, maybe it is holding your hand differently. I know with that stupid... Um, scale that Logan helped me with, it was because I was holding tension at one point in my hand and I wasn't getting into my position fast enough. Um, I'll do a video on that at some point once I've um, 
had some time to really process it. There was just this past week that I met with him actually, which is so funny um, that it plagued me for this long and it was such a simple solution. But it was just a little adjustment in my mind didn't really have anything to do with these. I remember Sergei Babayano says, what is this? It's a piece of meat. It doesn't do anything. The mind does everything. And I loved that because uh, if you can solve something in your mind, I remember I was maybe 16 or 17. This was giving me some trouble. And once I started to give myself over, To the idea of just rotating back and forth a bit more than I was. I was isolating those fingers a little too much. Um, it, it completely loosened the hand. I can't even tell you how many times I've done that in different passages, like done something at a different angle, a different position on the piano, a different type of rotating, a different type of activating the fingertips, whatever it might be, finding that new pathway. And this can be critical with mental health as well. If you have negative thought patterns, finding something to replace them with is extremely helpful. I've talked to a lot of people who've had addictions that have said getting rid of your addiction isn't just stopping the, the bad habit, it's actually replacing it with something that's more positive. So when you get into these bullying thought patterns or whatever it might be, you need to find that new pathway, whether it's a technical pathway or whether it's a mental pathway or whether it's a physical interaction that you're with, you need to find new pathways to success. So to sum this up, know your limits so you don't burn out because then you're useless to everybody. Make sure the second point was stop bullying yourself externally and internally. And then the last one is finding a new pathway. I hope these have been helpful. If any of you have any questions, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. Thank you so much for joining me today. Again, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to this channel, it really helps it to grow. I will also leave a few links in the description below. One of them is for a free webinar containing 10 of my favorite tips to help take your playing to a higher level. These are tips I use every single day in my own practicing and teaching. I'll leave a couple of links to my paid courses if you are interested in going even deeper than this channel goes over. And finally, I will leave a link to my kit, which is all the gear I use in my studio um, to produce these videos, to record myself um, at home, uh, to record students if they need to make recordings, and many more things, good books, good resources in that kit. So I'll leave all those links in the description below. Have a great week. Good luck in your practice sessions.